integrated plant health. My name is Kurt Becker. I'm with Dram Corporation. Dram is a company that is now 81 years old. We started in 1941 with the founding of the company with the development of the 400 AL water breaker. This is a good symbol for us to begin this discussion because this tool marked the beginning of our company's uh, start, uh, process of developing tools to improve the way growers grow their plants. In this instance, we were trying to improve the way water was applied to the media so that it would saturate evenly without digging into the soil. Since then, we've developed a number of different watering tools along those lines, but we've also developed spray equipment to offer a wide range of application droplet sizes and, and directions and targeting. Uh, we have airflow systems that are designed to improve um, the climate in the greenhouse as well as the plant growth. We have irrigation systems that we design to help growers do a better job of watering their plants more efficiently with less resources. And we have water management systems that are designed to improve and reduce the amount of water used. All of these things are part of integrated plant health. The first, you know, when we talk about spray equipment, we look at those things, those are band-aids. Those are a corrective action to a problem that already occurs. The other things, environmental control, irrigation systems, complete design systems, those are holistic solutions. Those are ways to improve uh, the plant health so that we prevent some of those issues. This talk is going to focus on those four different areas. First, we're going to talk about spray equipment and choosing, understanding the different types of equipment available so you can help choose which one is going to be appropriate for the, the types of applications you need to make. We're going to talk about the environmental controls portion of our business and how that can help improve plant health. Irrigation systems in the same way. We can improve plant health by designing and providing irrigation systems that do a better job of watering the plants. And then finally, the way we deliver your water and the way you manage your water can have a huge impact on plant health and plant growth over time. Each of those we'll, talk, we'll cover in this discussion. Starting with chemical application equipment, it's important that we understand the unit of measure that we're discussing. When we're talking about droplets and, and spraying and applying products to a plant or a crop, it's all dependent on the droplet size that we use to do this. To understand that, you understand and you need to be able to rate the, relate those droplets. And in that regard, we have this unit of measure called the micron. The symbol on the screen is the, is the symbol for micron. Micron is a linear measurement like a foot or a yard or a mile, uh, but much smaller. So here we're talking about a very, very small drop, a small, small part of our measurement um, that would be used to measure droplets of small size. Your hair is about 100 microns in diameter. That's also a useful dividing line when we look at the spraying world. Typically things larger than 100 microns, we fit into the hydraulic world, hydraulic wet sprays. And below that we fit into the low volume realm. So droplets where we can use less liquid, um, maybe have finer and more droplets. As we look into this, we want to understand the relationship between the different droplets that we can create. Um, and there's some important things that can help you in your everyday spraying and as well as in the selection of spray equipment that you might be looking to purchase or utilize in your facility for different jobs. If we were to take one 100 micron droplet or a droplet the size of your hair and we took the liquid in that droplet and we chopped this droplet into droplets that were half the size or 50 microns in diameter, we're actually going to create eight droplets with the same amount of liquid contained in the one 100 micron droplet. If we take the 100 micron droplet and we break that down to a tenth of the original size, or we create 10 micron droplets, we're going to create about a thousand droplets with the same amount of liquid that's contained in the one 100 micron droplet. If we go off this graphic and we create droplets that are a 20th of the original size or five microns, which is something we can do with certain technologies, we're going to create about 19,000 droplets with the same amount of liquid in that one droplet of 100 microns or the size of your hair. 
That's how we get to this concept of low volume. We can use a whole lot less water to cover surface area because we're breaking the droplets so small that they will cover the surface area very well by themselves um, without a lot of liquid to do the job. Now, this also illustrates ways that you can improve your everyday regular sprays because this ratio doesn't only go from 100 microns, 50 microns, 10 microns. It's any time you take a droplet and cut it down in half, you're going to get eight times more droplets. Anytime I take a droplet and I cut it down to a tenth of the original size, I'm going to get a thousand times more droplets. So let's say I have a sprayer that's applying a 500 micron particle size, wet spray, fairly low pressure, fairly big nozzle, maybe the nozzle I'm using to apply shade, a rough coarse spray. If I take that and simply replace the tip with a finer tip, maybe increase the pressure, easily achievable to get to 250 microns. By doing that, I can create eight times more droplets with the amount of liquid in that tank, cover more surface area as a result. Now, taking that 500 micron droplet, maybe making a 50 micron droplet, I can make a thousand droplets with the same amount of liquid, thousand times more droplets with the same amount of liquid that's contained in that tank, just by reducing the particle size. This is something that you can go home and do right away just to improve your applications. If you're not using all the pressure that your sprayer has, some sprayers move, you know, ours work at 500 PSI. If you're running them at 200, 250, because you're just a little bit worried that you're going to blast things, don't. Increase the particle, increase the pressure typically decreases the droplet size. To take this concept a little bit further, if we have one 100 micron droplet, and we chop it up into 10 micron droplets, you can see how when you put those end to end, they're gonna cover a lot more surface area. And that's because we're taking that droplet and we're spreading it out into a much greater number of droplets that when laid end to end, cover more surface. Now this is similar to what we're doing chemically with a surfactant, but we're mechanically doing it without any extra chemistries needed to do this job. Um, and we're doing it in a way that the droplets all then will float and settle around the plant versus having to be hit and then spread out as they, as they grow. Now to beat this analogy to a pulp, if this is our friend, the greenhouse white fly, this is what 100 micron looks to him, like to him. If I have one droplet of spray solution to hit him with, that's 100 microns, this is what's gonna, I get, I've got one chance to hit him. If I have eight 50 micron droplets, the same amount of liquid, I've got eight chances. If I break that down into 10 micron droplets, I've got a thousand chances. Now, each one of those droplets may not have the same amount of active ingredient in them as the one 100 micron droplet, but they're gonna have enough, and I'm gonna hit them multiple times. Typically, when we're using low volume methods, we're actually concentrating the spray solution more than we would with a wet spray so that each drop will have more of a dose. So when we look at the different equipment that we're using to produce these droplets, they're kind of like tools in a toolbox. There's a lot of different ways that we can create particles to be applied to a crop. Much like there's ways to fasten things together. We can use nails and hammers. We can use screws and screwdrivers. We can use bolts and wrenches. Each of those are different tools that we might employ in our homes or in our workplaces to do these types of jobs. All of them are different. They all have different benefits, different detractions, just like spray equipment. Matching the right tool to the job is important when we're building a house or when we're spraying we would suggest that you need more than one option when you're looking at treating your, your greenhouse um, and managing pests. You need to probably have several different tools to do multiple jobs so that you're getting the right benefit as when, at the time you need it. At DRAM, we kind of break the world into these five different areas, and this is what we're going to talk about throughout the rest of this talk. Spray equipment typically can be broken down into hydraulic sprays, which is something that pretty much everybody's familiar with. Wet spray, um, spray to the point of runoff. Low volume, we break into two different portions. Targeted low volume is going to be a little bit bigger droplet. I can aim it. I don't have to fill a whole space. 
ultra low volume is going to be something that I'm going to use to fill a room. It's a space treatment option, um, but typically either automatic or really fast. Drenching is something that is more and more commonly used, um, whether it's going to be for fungicide applications, uh, plant growth regulators, systemic insecticides. And then foaming is something that's becoming more and more common as we understand the benefits of proper sanitation. This is one of those tools where, you know, maybe it's, it's, not, it's less a Band-Aid and more of a holistic approach. If we can keep things clean before we bring plants into the equation, we can generally prevent a lot of problems. So foaming is something that we'll, we'll touch on at the end of this. When we look, starting with hydraulic sprayers, we look at the types of different equipment that are out there. Um, we're looking at a wetter spray. So we're looking at, you know, spray to the point of runoff. You're gonna see the results of your application on the plant. Now, how much you see is, is really dependent on how well you use your machine and the type of machine and the pressure and everything else. But you're gonna see the residue. You're gonna be directing this at the target. This is not something you're gonna fill a room with. You're gonna aim it, point, shoot. Droplets are typically gonna be greater than 100 microns or larger than your hair. Um, very commonly, spray droplets are bigger than 200 microns in the industry. Most of our equipment has about 150, 170 particle, you know, micron size particle range at the finest settings. Um, they can always be made coarser through adjustable variable pressure. Um, we believe that this type of equipment should use variable pressure because there's going to be times when you may not want the finest droplet. I'm trying to prevent some drift. I'm trying to um, target a specific area of a bench. I'm trying to sprench and just get more of the solution out of the media. Um, there's lots of reasons why you may want lower pressure, but you always are going to want the ability to turn that up and get the finest spray possible. Then, of course, this is a tool that you can drench with. You can apply to the media. When we look at the way that these types of spray patterns work, typically we're looking for a spray that is forward momentum, lots of swirling, smaller droplets. Adjustability is a nice thing because there may be times when you may need to coarsen the spray up, but that's also going to make a bigger droplet when you do. Typically, when we use this machine, we're looking at having the finest spray pattern to do the job. Low volume, we're going to start with the targeted. Targeted low volume is a much drier spray. In fact, it's one of the more difficult ways that we have to train people um, in using their, their spray equipment because someone used to a wet spray, aiming a, aiming a gun, seeing the results of the spray on the plant, it's going to be a difficult time with this just because you're not going to see the results of your spray. You're not going to see wet plants. We don't want you to see wet plants. In this regard, you want, you're going to have a much drier application. You're going to see the plants move around and dance, and that's about it. You're going to have to trust that the machine does its job. There are some spray guides that you can use, like hydrosensitive paper, that can help you determine if that's really happening. Maybe build some confidence in the way you're applying. Um, but that's because the droplets here are less than 100 microns. So we're creating droplets typically with these types of machines in the 50 micron range. So fine, small droplets. Um, they're going to be more concentrated. You're going to aim them. They're going to go where you want them to go. They're not going to drift everywhere else but it's going to leave a lot less residue on the plant. It is an aim and spray. You're going to aim it where you want it to go. It's going to generally stay in that area. But this offers a lot of flexibility. Let's say, for instance, you have impatiens and tomatoes in the same greenhouse. You're either going to use the lowest common denominator pesticide or one that may not be all that effective on your pests on the, in, in the impatient realm, or you're going to use two different applications. You're going to spray the impatiens and you spray tomatoes differently. Um, these types of machines allow you to do that with greater speed, generally finer application, and a much drier application. Um, this is going to allow you to spray a bench. It's going to allow you to spray along the, the vents, uh, you know, just to get it, get it, prevent some things coming in. Um, the drier spray, however, is also very useful when we're applying uh, fungicides. You know, typically a lot of people discount these as an application for fungicides. They're actually a really good tool for that for contact-based products. So as long as you're applying a product that's meant to target something that's on the leaf, uh, the stem, um, these tools work really well, and that's because they can get really good coverage, but they do it without a lot of extra water. And water is typically part of the problem when we're dealing with a pathogen issue. So when you see this 
type of tool work. You're going to notice the plants are not getting wet. You're moving fairly quickly through the canopy. Um, this doesn't look all that fast, but when you think about how long you might be there with a wet spray, it's, it's quicker. You're generally moving at a fixed rate of speed based on the area because you're trying to apply a product to a, a given square foot range. You typically want to see the plant move, and that's generally going to be enough to get good coverage because the droplets are so small, they're going to adhere pretty well, and they're going to be a lot of them, so they're going to get all around the plant. Again, in this type of application, you're not getting anything really wet, so it's not going to be causing any more um, humidity or, or moisture management issues. Ultra low volume is really a space treatment. We are filling a space bound by walls with a fog. That fog is very dry, um, half a gallon, maybe a gallon per acre um, is what you'd be applying to the area. You're looking at droplets that are less than 25 microns, um, can be as small as five, like the, the auto fog there creates about a five micron average particle size. Those droplets are going to float in the air and drift for hours. So it's important that the facility remains closed up, um, no vents, we don't, you know, fans may be useful in helping to distribute these throughout the facility, but we do not want to have any ventilation fans on. You're not gonna see any residue from this. You're really gonna see very little impact in terms of wetness or, uh, or residue on the plants. We do want this bounded by walls. We wanna have a space closed. You cannot do half a greenhouse with these types of machines. You're gonna do the whole space. And that's because the fog is gonna drift into different areas. These systems can either be automatic or very fast. Uh, the auto fog on the left has a timer. You set, the, you mix the chemical, you set it in the greenhouse, set the timer and leave. You come in, in the morning and it's done its job. It turned on, it fogged, it turned off. You come in and clean it up. Now that'll take several hours in some instances depending on how large the area is. So it's really good for one room overnight application. The thermal foggers, that pulse fog uh, on the bottom right, that is a jet engine and consequently very fast. It's also very loud, but the way that this works is you are propelling the pesticide and fog um, using jet propulsion that can throw, this machine can throw the fog 200 and some feet um, from one point, and it can do that very rapidly. That tank is 50,000, will cover 50,000 square feet, and it will empty that tank in 10 minutes. So you can cover a lot of area very quickly. Um, there's times when you may, both of these machines have really overlap in the way that you'd use them, in the areas you'd use them. It's more of a logistical issue at this point. Something like the autofog is great when I have two, three, four, individual gutter connected ranges. I can set up the machine once a night for, you know, for four nights and I can get the whole place done without being there. If I have 12, 13 individual houses and I have or, or a range of places I need to get through, that becomes a little bit more difficult with the auto fog because it's really meant to sit in that house overnight. If I have 12 houses, that's either 12 nights or it's me buying multiple machines and then it's every night for six nights. Whereas the thermal fogger, I could stand in, the, say, a 30 by 96 foot greenhouse, I could stand in that for less than a minute with the machine shown, move to the next house, move to the next house. If I have 20 of those, I could be done in less than a half an hour filling the whole place, and I could do that once a week. So there's reasons why you might select either one of these machines, quite often based on logistics. When you see the auto fog running here, you're going to notice as we pull back the video, you really don't see the fog. Um, this machine is much slower than the pulse fog, so it's going to put less volume out per, over time, over, you know, in, a, in a short period of time, but over time it'll put the same amount out. You just need time for it to apply. These machines are very precise and allow for the droplets to, to you know, they're very evenly created droplets. Those are going to float throughout the facility for several hours during the application. The thermal fogger on the other hand, is a little bit more of a sloppy machine. It's very loud, it's very forceful, it's going to propel that pesticide solution throughout the facility very quickly. If you look at this greenhouse, this is a typical Quonset style 30 by 96. Um, this machine would take less than two minutes to fill this, and you'll see as we fog, 
in, the, in this video, you're going to see how quickly the room fills up. Um, basically, you're propelling this fog down through the facility. Um, you're putting out a lot more volume per minute than you would with the auto fog. And that's going to fill that space to the point where you're done in a minute and a half and you can go into the next house and continue on. Moving on to drenching. Drenching is a method of application that can either be, you know, very simple. So we're just applying a fungicide and we're splashing it around and we really don't care where it goes. We want to get some into the media, but we also don't mind if it gets on the, the ground or the pot around it. Or it can be things like PGR where the dose is very important and the growth of the plant is dependent on that. You know, we're looking at this to be, this is a very, this is a pro, this is an application that's like watering. Um, but the way you do this could be very chemical dependent, depending on the amount of precision required to do this. As I said, a, a PGR, if you're going to apply bonsai as a drench, you want to make sure you're putting the right amount on every plant and the same amount on every plant to get the same result. If we're applying fungicides or things that are less, um, less active or less, uh, less damaging, should they be overdosed or underdosed, that's less of an issue. So you may use an injector uh, with a wand, just like you were watering the fertilizer, or you may use a hydraulic sprayer. Um, otherwise, you may use tools like these. Uh, these are both ChemDose machines that we manufacture. Um, the one on the right is a pump designed version, 20 gallon tank. You have a pump that cycles on and off based on um, activity of a button, and you can go put the exact dose right into a container and measure, you know, have that dose basically cycled into the container. The one on the left is actually meant to work with either an injector or hydraulic sprayer um, and is less dependent on hose length tank size. This little 20 gallon version is pretty much as large as it's gonna get and the hose is gonna be 25 feet and that's as long as it's gonna get. Great for smaller applications. If you need to do larger applications, the one on the left is gonna give you the ability to measure every dose. There's a meter in here that will measure the dose and start and stop as you select um, to apply that exact same dose every single time. Even if the, the flow rate at the pump or the flow rate of the injector changes, the dose will always be accurate. Finally, disinfection is something that has become a much, much bigger, important tool in ornamental horticulture. It's always been one in vegetables. It's been one in livestock, other parts of agriculture that we service. Um, DRAM's actually made foaming equipment for 25 years. Ornamental horticulture is just starting to understand this, and you know, the vegetable guys have always had to deal with it because of the pathogens they had to deal with. Phytophthoropithium, things like that, they have that. Fusarium, those are economically potentially damaging to your crop. They have to worry about things like E. coli, listeria, um, salmonella, things that are going to hurt their consumer. And that causes them to have a little bit greater um, reliance on sanitation because they can't have those things being shipped with their plants and ingested. However, the benefit is that they're also killing some of the pathogens that would damage their plants. This is something that when we look at an integrated plant health program and trying to keep the plants healthy before we have to go spray for a pathogen, sometimes it's better to start off clean. Um, sanitation, using disinfectants properly, is a great way to do that. Uh, DRAM promotes, uh, manufactures and promotes these foaming equipment to help do a better job. Um, there's, we have a lot of disinfectants available to us as an industry. However, all of them are going to benefit from contact time. The longer they can stay on the surface, the better job they're going to do. The more action they will have on plant pathogens on the surfaces that you're trying to decontaminate. Foam does that by making the, the, the foam, the liquid drier and making it adhere. So when we look at the types of different equipment that's out there, there are other foaming equipment available that are typically like hose end. They're generally fairly inexpensive. Um, they siphon air out of the atmosphere into the solution as it's passing by. And they typically make suds. And the reason they make suds is that they're using atmospheric pressure of air. In our instance, we're typically using 50, 60 PSI, and we're, I'll be able to push more air into the liquid as a result. Even this little spray canister 
we pressurize it to 60 psi, we leave an air reservoir at the top, and we mix that air with the liquid as it's exiting the tank. And that's going to give us a much, much drier foam. When we, these other units with the yellow hoses, those all have compressed air attached to them. They run off of compressed air, no, no electricity. Um, and, but that 60 psi of air is gonna help create a very, very dry application so that when you foam, you're getting something like this, where you, you know, the foam is gonna to stick to, say, an expanded metal bench like this. It's gonna fill in the cracks and crevices. It's going to stick to vertical surfaces. Um, so we can spray walls with this. Great for taking algae off the end walls of a greenhouse or the side walls, um, off posts, places where there's overspray from misting equipment, things like that. Doing this and letting it sit on the surface is going to do a much better job of dis disinfecting those surfaces. Now you can see that in this video where we're here we're just, we've got an air-driven foamer and it's applying a disinfectant foam to expanded metal benches. It's gonna stick there for 15, 20 minutes. That's gonna increase the contact time and increase the activity of that disinfectant. Then you just hose it off and it's gonna, you know, you'll have a much cleaner surface as a result. So as I said, we're typically using these for disinfectants, but we are looking into other methods um, of application or different types of chemistries to use foam for. Systemic insecticides, this might be a tool that we can use to get greater contact time so that there's better absorption. Um, herbicides is another thing we're looking at. With the right surfactants to be able to create a foam, a herbicide being applied, um, number one is much more visible where you applied it. Uh, it's gonna sit on the surface longer, so better contact time. Uh, so hopefully it has a stronger impact, but also less volatilization. We don't have little small droplets floating around and we don't have that evaporating and causing problems um, with the plants we actually want to keep. So we're looking into those applications with this type of method of application. So now when we talk about environmental control, uh, we're going to move into the areas where we're less corrective in our applications and were more proactive. Um, environmental control for DRAM came about primarily with the beginning of adding HAF to our product line about 30 years ago, 27 years ago. This was initially done to help the autofog distribute fog around the facility, but we quickly realized that air movement had a huge impact on the climate and doing a better job of helping to grow the plants. One of the things we found most oftenly, HAF is move, used to, in our instance, we wanted to move pesticide evenly throughout the facility, but we found that that also helped move humidity, temperature, CO2, and help homogenize the, the climate. But the other thing we found is that if we could keep air movement very even throughout the crop, we were also able to impact plant growth. And that's because of the way plants transpire and, and, re and relieve humidity. As they transpire, there's a small microclimate of humidity that, that builds around the plant's tissue. Air movement is very critical in helping that move away from the plant. If the air is uneven throughout the facility, you're gonna get different rates of, of that being moved away from the plant tissue, which is then going to impact tr transpiration. The more the, the, the humidity layer that's, if the humidity layer stays around the plant tissue, it's not going, the plant's not gonna transpire as much because there'll be a greater pressure, a pressure of vapor at that point. By moving that away, we can help encourage the plant to transpire. Now, if we do that with turbulent air, we can cause some plants to have more transpiration than others. Our approach to this is to provide the most even stable momentum of air across the facility so that we get even moisture removal and then even transpiration as a result. We do that through reduced speed of fans and a shrouded fan. Humidity in general though can be an issue as well. There's times when it's too high and there's times when it's too low. Uh, DRAM is proud to partner with Vifra, an Italian company that specializes in both dehumidification and humidification of spaces. There's times when we might require both tools uh, in, in instances, you know, dehumidification is a tool that 
can be is being used very commonly in medicinal and indoor crops and things like that because of the way humidity builds in those facilities. But it's also a tool that can be used very even very well in especially as energy costs increase um, in colder climates in the middle of winter dehumidification is a tool that can be used instead of venting as frequently um, and that can reduce heat cost inputs but also it, it ends up with much less temperature variance in the facility as we open and close vents we get huge swings in temperature and in humidity with the dehumidification system, you can keep that much more even over time, um, use less energy as a result, but also have better plant growth. Uh, humidity systems, though, if we want to be applying uh, high pressure fog to a facility, that might be a place where we, we need to add humidity in propagation, in drier climates, in fully concrete greenhouses. There's gonna be times where humidity addition is gonna be very useful. Now, one of the things that's important with everything we're gonna talk about going forward is that at that all of these systems that we do here are engineered. We're looking at engineering a solution for airflow. We're looking at engineering a solution for humidity management. In each instance, we're gonna design a system for you and put it together into a package so that it gets designed to do what we need it to do for your facility. In addition to providing generally better plant growth, Proper irrigation systems are, have the, the ability to reduce labor greatly. In today's economic climate, that's important. Uh, we've seen a great number of growers looking at ways to automate their irrigation so that they can they need to rely less on um, individual labor to make that happen. In our instances, DRAM is going to design complete systems, and each one of those can reduce labor, but most importantly, they're going to provide a better result for plant growth. Um, if we're looking at propagation systems, we are going to not only provide the nozzles, we're going to provide a design, we're going to provide the structure that, that those nozzles live on, um, the plumbing to those nozzles, the filters, the solenoid valves, even the control. All of that comes as a kit, ready to be assembled easily. Less chance, less trips to the hardware plumbing supply, uh, less goofing around trying to figure out how to make it work. DRAM can work with you to make sure that this is done right. When it comes to drip irrigation system, the same is true. We're going to include all the components that are necessary to make this work. If you've got a, a flexible benching or removable benching, we're going to include hoses that make it so that it's easy to move that back and forth. We're going to include the plumbing that connects all of that. When we look at overhead irrigation systems, the same is true. Support systems to hold the, the, the nozzles rigid and aligned. Um, our design services to make sure that they're spaced and designed properly for your facility. And then finally, sub-irrigation. DRAM offers a capillary matting um, that we can design. These are great for watering potted plants, really good addition to propagation systems, really good tool all around, but easy to automate with the addition of drip irrigation. We can run drip lines down here and fill that up to its capacity, allowing just the right amount of moisture to uh, be used for those plants. In each of these instances, DRAM is going to design the system. We want to work with you to design the right system for your facility so that you have the, the right result when it comes to an irrigation system. We wanna make sure that you have enough water to make sure the nozzles work right. We wanna make sure that you have the nozzles spaced properly for proper coverage. All of those things are important and built into our design. When you're looking to design a system, you can contact your Griffin rep. Um, they can collect the information for you or you can go to our website and you can fill in a, a form that will help gather information for us to be able to provide a quote. You're going to provide your distributor's information as well as your own contact information and you will end up getting a quote from us that will be a design unique to your facility, ready to go, very easy to put together. The last stage of this is tying it all together. Um, water integration is something that we look at as being very important to our industry growing. Water usage is increasing, water availability is decreasing. We're gonna to need to use our water better. But more importantly, there's already problems we see right now. Pathogens, we see poor quality water in facilities. DRAM water was designed, or developed 12 years ago to address this by providing proper solutions for water quality, for water handling, storage, for pumping, 
for filtration. All of these things are, there are needs that our industry has, and there's very little design and engineering that goes into it um, with a holistic approach to making sure that it's done right, that it's done for consideration of growth in the future. DRAM can help provide those solutions to you, and we want to work with you in that regard. You can contact your Griffin rep or contact us directly, and we can help you put together a plan to make sure that you are managing your water properly, disinfecting your water, filtering your water, storing your water, and eventually recycling your water because we're getting to a point where that's going to become more and more important. We have a full team out there ready for you guys to be able to help. Um, of course, you can use our website to, uh, to enter any of the information to prepare any of the quotes that we've discussed, or you, you can contact your Griffin rep, or you can contact your local DRAM representative. Um, this map shows the full team. Uh, in the Northeast, we have Brett Krosner uh, out of Philadelphia. Russell Blackwell is in Alabama and covers the Southeast. Scott Sterling is in Kansas and covers the central portion of the country. I'm in Wisconsin and cover the upper Midwest. Mark Radzma is in Idaho and covers the western U.S. area. The contact information for each of us is listed here. Um, we do have two other people addition added to this list. Uh, Jared Babick and Tim Reich are our integrated project specialists. They're working on um, full integration projects uh, to a much larger scale, water management, water irrigation, all of it can, can combined into one package, uh, complete, drawn, uh, and, and provided all the solutions and services that go with it. Um, they would work with any number of member of our team or any member of the Griffin team to be able to help you out with those services. Thank you for your time in this watching this webinar today. If you are interested in us sending you a copy of the slides. Uh, you can copy down that URL, it's a little long, or you can just scan it with this QR code, uh, scan the QR code here and get sent to that page. Fill in your contact information, request the slides from this, Google, from this Griffin presentation, and we will email you a copy. Thank you very much for your time.